Hi everyone, and welcome to our session today. I'm Aaron Merle, and I'm one of Nudesic's National Solutions Directors. Um, I actually have the best job ever because I have the dual privilege of being able to help our customers solve real technology and business problems, as well as um, the enjoyment of being able to lead and focus our technical strategy. And in my case, specifically as it relates to API management. So my goal for today is to give you a big picture view of how APIs are poised to make a massive difference in how we do business inside and outside of our companies. I want you to walk away with an understanding of what the API economy is and how it's challenging us to rethink our businesses. And I also want to introduce you to something that you might not have heard about before called API management and how it is a key enabler as we enter this new era. And I'd be lying if I told you that I didn't want you to walk away with a bit of a sense of urgency on API strategy. But first, I think we need to get properly synced up on terminology. Some of you, um, probably the most technical in the crowd, will know these concepts already, but it's important that we get this right so we can build on it later, so please bear with us. We're gonna talk a lot about APIs today. So before we go any further, we need to know what an API is. An API is an acronym for Application Programming Interface. To make simple sense of this, um, contrast this with a UI or a user interface that is built for humans to interact with. User interfaces are highly visual. They have buttons to click on, you use them every day. Um, they have animations that we watch, text that we read. Whether you're using an email client or your favorite website or playing a game on your mobile device, a UI is what affords your ability to interact with a software that lives on the other side of that user interface. An API is functionally the same, except that it isn't for people at all. It was built for other apps to interact with, and naturally, instead of producing something visual, it offers an ability to accept and hand out structured data. Now, something that's remarkable about what we can do with APIs that we can't do quite as nicely with visual UIs, not that we haven't tried, is that we can compose them almost infinitely. We can have APIs that use other APIs and UIs that mash up and combine APIs to achieve interesting and really unexpected things. And this is where the phrase API economy becomes relevant. Because just like the real economy, the API economy is messy. It's about exchanges, primary and secondary markets for information, trading, bartering, and selling. The metaphor just works. Today, we're gonna to look at APIs and the kind of thinking that begets APIs through this lens of business. And in particular, using a set of stories as illustrations about businesses that you may have heard about. We'll use these stories to talk about some of the relevant concepts as we go. On September 1st, 2010, an article was published in Inc. Magazine about a small software company named 37 Signals. At this point, you probably know them better through the name of their collaboration product, Basecamp. At that point, they had been in business for about 11 years and they kept finding themselves in the position of needing to find new office space in Chicago. They had grown out of co-working spaces and they had leases that expired out from one of them. And at some point, they found themselves a successful software company with three employees in a 3,500 square foot space. Besides their three desks, a conference room, and the personal space that they, they had, they only occupied about a quarter of the entire office. They were selling software, so the $2,500 a month rent wasn't so much a burden, but sooner or later, they started looking at their office space the way most other companies would as a fixed cost that needed to be addressed. What's remarkable about 37 Signals though is what they did next. And I think what they did is a great example of the kind of thinking that we're all going to need to adopt and get comfortable with as we think about whether APIs are meaningful to our individual companies. Instead of doing what conventional wisdom might have suggested, which is downsizing, they began to look at their company introspectively from the inside out, look at the guts. And what they found was that they didn't just have unused office space, they had an ecosystem. They had a product, they had a loyal public following through their blog, a contagious culture, a way of going about development that other people subscribed to and really wanted to be a part of, and that extra office space with a little creativity instantly became a place to hold conferences. 
They put together an agenda and they started hosting conferences in the extra space that they had once every six weeks. They sold tickets and they created a completely new revenue stream that subsidized their rent, covering about three months worth of rent for every conference. But most importantly, they exported their culture a little bit further and a little bit deeper in the, into the developer community. And they pumped that value back into the product. They converted their business into a platform and they helped their customers consume that platform in an entirely new way. Now, spoiler alert, this story doesn't actually have any APIs involved. If you're expecting that part to come, you can stop waiting. Um, what I really wanted to get across was the kind of thinking that's going on here, because I believe that this kind of thinking is one of the major challenges in front of us to re-envision our companies as platforms and to find ways to give our partners, customers, and sometimes, in some cases, even our competitors, new ways to access the value from within it. Ultimately, for a profit. Now our next story I'm sure you're all familiar with to some degree, but if you're like me, you can barely remember the days when Netflix was only in the business of shuttling DVDs through the mail, even though it really wasn't that long ago. Now fast forward, Netflix accounts for over 30% of the internet traffic in the evenings as people stream movies and shows to more than 400 different kinds of devices. Now, the big news with Netflix and APIs lately is a little bit counter to my presentation today, but I'll still mention it. It's actually that they've just started to shut down access to their set of public APIs um, that gave access to their platform of content. We can talk about whether that's a signal or an event that we should expect in the life cycle of an API later, but I want to talk about first how it got to the point where it mattered to begin with. Because in the battle to own this space in entertainment, offering APIs allowed Netflix to secure a dominant position by leveraging a huge network of partner platforms. Apps and devices sprang up overnight that used the API, allowing us to access Netflix on our phones, our TVs, our set-top boxes, our streaming players, our game consoles, you name it. And Netflix is a textbook example of using an API to dramatically extend the reach of the platform that already exists and to leverage the scale that only partners can offer. While Netflix enjoyed the benefits of the API springboard, so did the business in our next story. So our next example is actually one that I'm going to steal quite liberally from our friend and partner Evgeny Popov at Microsoft. And, and this one's all about extending the value of the platform through APIs and partners. Now, Salesforce has always been a prototypical example of a rapid application development platform that recognized the value early on in exposing underlying data through APIs. Now, just using the tool itself, you can model your business in Salesforce, get data in the tool, and then begin interacting with that data through automatically exposed APIs to create rich experiences outside of the rapid application environment for whatever audience you're serving, whether it's sales, marketing, operations, even consumer. Now that's just the tip of the iceberg though. Something else remarkable that Salesforce did was to expose the management aspects of the platform through APIs. And by doing this, they opened up the door to build a vibrant ecosystem of extensions to Salesforce. And so the end result actually looks something like this. The sales team is the first team to be introduced to Salesforce. And of course, there's some licensing revenue associated with that for Salesforce. But then a partner application becomes available for invoicing. And all of a sudden your accounting team becomes interested. They plop out some cash for the invoicing module and Salesforce gets more licensing revenue. The same thing happens with staffing. Suddenly a staffing solution becomes available. HR teams get interested, more revenue for partners, more revenue for Salesforce. The story goes on and on and on. Take a look at Salesforce now and the app exchange, the ecosystem built on top of their APIs. And this is what we see. They've been doing some things right because they've got more than 2,500 different apps that service different aspects of doing business on their platform. Now you tell me, would their platform be as valuable to a customer without the APIs and without all the partners? I don't think so. The question is, what in your business is similar? And I hope as we've been talking 
that you've been seeing some parallels and some um, commonalities across all these stories. All these stories involve businesses who've been successful in shifting their thinking and packaging their internals as a platform to create an advantage. So we see this shift from product to platform. And then we also see that the benefits of offering APIs can take the following shapes. You can have direct monetization, where the API is the business model. You charge per use and the platform is the product. Examples of this would be Twilio, uh, a service that offers telecommunication functions via an API. And then you also have indirect monetization, not unlike our Salesforce example, where the API allows partners to extend and compose your core offering and it brings you new market opportunities in exchange for innovation. Ultimately, you've got new market share, market that would have been impossible for you to capture on your own. In each case, it's also important to notice the scale and rapidity with which these changes have occurred and the value that was created. Now, a year or two ago, this talk may have been something that would be a lot easier to dismiss, but I'd like to show you the very real trend that suggests we're on the precipice of something really big. In fact, we can already see evidence that things are changing. Take a look at the trend in the number, in the number of public APIs that came into being between 2006 and 2013. We're seeing an absolute explosiveness and the exponential expansion of APIs and the impact that they're having on companies. And there's undoubtedly a link between what's going on here and what's going on in the growth of mobile, cloud, open and big data, as well as this thing that we're calling the internet of things. Now compare this to the trend in the number of mobile apps in the two strongest markets, and I expect you to see a correlation. Take a look at the very beginning of these curves in 2008, 2009, when apps first started to come on scene and people began to adopt them. It eventually flattens out into a more linear sort of uh, arrangement, but I expect to see some of the same radical changes repeat themselves that we saw before only in API form now. First, we saw consumerization happen. And then we saw them mobile apps creep into the infrastructure in IT. Today, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a business that hasn't done some investment in mobile apps, both internally and externally. Modern APIs commonly serve as the back-end communication channels for mobile apps as well and have, embed, have, and have enabled a whole new class of devices in the Internet of Things explosion that we're seeing in the health and body telemetry tracking devices that we're seeing on the market. I know some of you may be from startups and product companies um, and maybe getting this and absorbing it, but uh, I know a lot of you for sure spend your days like me in the enterprise and are kind of scratching your heads and wondering how to fit this Amazon, Netflix, Twitter relevance into your business. I hope you're listening because the next fact is for you. More than five times the number of APIs that we see in the open API space are present in the enterprise space. Now you can see, even where we're tracking open APIs, the kinds of categories that are the fastest growing within the last six months. And you can see evidence that productivity is really blazing the trail here. In the future, as Craig Burton has become famous for saying, we expect APIs to be so pervasive that everyone and everything will have its own API. Ultimately, we want to exploit APIs as a way to offer our partners, our developers, and our customers access to a deeper set of value that we can provide in order to create scale and value for our own businesses. Now, if you're not yet convinced, consider this company that I found um, mentioned in a roundtable talk on the API economy. And I've kind of highlighted in bold the, the most important words that I want you to get out of this. Um, this company devised a way for you to create an Excel spreadsheet, put it in Dropbox and have the end result be a published JSON API that can be consumed by applications. This is remarkable because whether it, it's the right thing to do or not to allow an API to be created strictly from an Excel spreadsheet, it's something that's happening and it's allowing our non-technical users to create things that can interact with the rest of the application world. Now, if I haven't succeeded in getting your attention yet on how pervasive APIs are going to be or on the urgency factor involved, let me take you into the impact of it using something that Sean Gurley absolutely blew my mind with when I saw his TEDx New Wall Street video on YouTube. Something that Peter Vander Ora mentions on his blog also, 
and he does it very eloquently, which I will now approach in a much less eloquent fashion. Um, Peter talks about the explosion of time. Now, when I think about this, I picture this guy. Remember Hammy from Over the Hedge? And, and for those of you who haven't seen Over the Hedge, I encourage you to grab the nearest seven-year-old that you can justify sitting down and seeing this movie with. Um, Hammy is an already hyperactive squirrel who at some point gets a hold of an energy drink and after guzzling it, experiences time in a way where milliseconds are elongated into minutes. And he ends up miraculously saving the day in the movie because of this, because he had time to process and make decisions where everyone else didn't. What's frightening is that this kind of scenario is already playing out. And, and Sean talks about experiments where humans, not squirrels, are put into an MRI machine with different images of chest situations and asked the question of, is your king in danger? Their brain was imaged as this was happening. And, and what we learn through this is that the best, most experienced chess players can process this and come to a conclusion in about 650 milliseconds. The average person in about 900 milliseconds. Now, contrast this with the world of algorithms and APIs. Particularly in the space of high-speed frequency trading, um, where decision-making logic is done and trades are executed within a fraction of one millisecond. I particularly like how Sean describes this world as alien. And it, it's true, it might as well be another planet where the environment is completely hostile to humans. Because just like astronauts, we can't exist natively there. We need special equipment to operate and function. We used to wear suits and ties to this world and, and shout our market orders to out to other humans, but now not so much. Now, up to 65% of all the trading is done by algorithms alone through APIs. And if you're standing back and saying, that's trading and I'm not in that business, yeah, but take a look at what's coming and think about the implications. Wearable devices, driverless cars, smart medical implants, personal dis digital assistants like Siri and Cortana are just beginning to shape the future of our world. Think about this. What will your company's function be in the world where everything is connected through an API and rules and decisions are being algorithmically decided? Limitations on the speed at which we can process things are ultimately going to give way to computers and APIs doing processing on our behalf in lots of ways outside of the stock market. So let's take a quick look back at what we've established. We've established that beyond the shadow of a doubt, an API tidal wave is arriving. It's not coming, it's here. Um, and in it lies a tremendous business opportunity and perhaps some risk in not taking advantage of it as well. So I'm gonna assume at this point that I've convinced you, that I've compelled you to think of APIs in a little bit of a different way, to be aware of them and to be aware of their power for what our businesses can achieve. But let's say that you take the next step, that you've re-envisioned your company as a platform, you've figured out how to reach in and capture all the value of your supply chain, your ecosystem, your customers, your partners, et cetera, et cetera, and you've got a set of APIs now. A set of APIs that you're hoping to extend your platform, to extend the value of your platform reach, and you wanna reach out to developers. Well, as it turns out, you can do this. I mean, we're doing this today, um, just maybe in some less eloquent ways in some cases. But as you do this, what happens is there's immediately a gulf between your API and the developers who would be users of your API. And you instantly start developing a to-do list. And you have this to-do list because not only do you need to expose an endpoint for that API so that developers can programmatically access it and applications can get to that API and make calls and receive responses, but there's a lot of tertiary work to be done in getting people involved, communicating with them appropriately, and managing and monitoring your API. Everything from onboarding developers, controlling access to your API, publishing the documentation around the operations in your API, establishing license agreements and records for who's agreed to what, segmenting service level agreements of parts of your API um, based on freemium or premium models perhaps, um, monitoring and billing for usage of your API, caching and scaling. You wanna find ways to limit your financial loss because if you're doing this in a cloud environment, 
um, you definitely don't want to incur the transactional cost of illicit transactions. You want to showcase the applications that developers have created as third parties so that you can generate more excitement and interest on your API. And you definitely want to get some developer feedback. So there's a ton of work to do here besides just publishing an API. And you start to realize this the moment you begin down, going down this road and endeavoring to publish APIs for your business. And we've been envisioning a lot of this as external to our business. But you have, as it turns out, a lot of the same problems if you're publishing APIs inside of your business as well. I mean, I can remember back on projects that I've worked on where we were publishing an API to another group or another product. And the way that we onboarded developers was really archaic. It amounted to us basically dedicating a person as a liaison to that team and to that person. Well, we're not going to achieve the scale and the empowerment that Netflix did onboarding 400 new device platforms by hand-holding API developers one at a time. We want to be able to scale this. We want to be able to, to, to leverage the impact of what we've built for our own success. And so what is the answer to this? The answer lies in something called API management, which is actually a class of tools. And in this presentation, we're really going to focus in on Azure API management. It's a service offering that Microsoft has come out with recently and put into the Azure portfolio. And Azure API management exists to service the needs beyond designing and developing an API. By the time you get here, you've already done that hard work. What you're looking at is Microsoft's approach to API management. And let's trace from the rightmost side of the screen to the left so you get a better feel for what's in the offering. To start with, you expose your API endpoint written in whatever language you want, on whatever technology you want, hosted on whatever operating system you want or wherever you want, on-prem or in the cloud, and API management provides a proxy. If you follow that arrow backwards from the right to the left, that you'll actually use as the published endpoint for your API instead of where it natively lives. That endpoint is what you'll give to developers who are wanting to build on top of your API. Its job is to accept incoming calls on behalf of your API so that it can relay them. But instead of just relaying, simply relaying them, it can apply all sorts of rules and policy. There's an old saying in software architecture about adding levels of abstraction to a system and how there's not too many problems that can't be solved that way. This is definitely the case with Azure API management. What we're doing is we're adding another level of abstraction to the, the way to access your API. <clears throat> in fact, by doing this, we get an opportunity to, supply, to apply some really cool things. We get to apply security rules, manage how frequently operations can be called, meter the usage of the API, cache frequently return values to increase responsiveness and reduce backend data transfer. Most of the workloads we reviewed on the previous slide are actually accomplished in some way through this proxy mechanism. It is the core of API management solutions. And of course, we need an ability to configure all of those things, and that is the function of, if you're looking slightly down, the publisher portal. This is the face of the product for Azure customers. This is where you'll come to configure that proxy in the environment around it. All of the tertiary things that we need to do to service our developer community are wrapped up in the developer portal up top. Everything, everything from allowing them to subscribe for service, to hosting API documentation in a standard way, to providing a way to submit issues and test, uh, and test the API with a console without writing a single line of code. These are all the kinds of things that successful API programs start with. And without the proper tooling, building all of this capability can be expensive and overwhelming. But with the proper tooling like Azure API Management, the barriers to succeeding with APIs drop to almost absolute zero. Here are some of the workloads that we can get done with Azure API Management. Service virtualization. We can expose and compose backend services handled by completely different applications. We can mediate protocols. We can convert services that are serving up legacy XML to JSON, JavaScript object notation. We can apply more granular security than what might be natively baked into the service itself. We can secure virtual services in a variety of ways and govern per consumer. Um, we can do metering and billing. 
We can register users, sign them up for the product tiers, and bill for their usage individually. Um, we can do caching and load balancing because ultimately, if our if our infrastructure is actually in the cloud, and we're shuttling that request to the back end and getting some data, shoving it up to the front, uh, we could be incurring uh, some charges and data transfer fees that could possibly be avoided. We could improve improve performance by configuring caching on frequently returned responses. We can do runtime monitoring and governments, uh, so we can monitor how frequently services are called. We can see who's using them, how many errors we're having, et cetera, et cetera. We can understand um, policy-based governance and documentation in a whole new way so that we're giving customers a clear license and SLA and that they have some expectations on which to build their business or composed application. So taking a deeper introspective look at how Azure API management manages APIs, um, it ultimately comes down to a model. So you can think of this as the way that APIs are viewed from the perspective of the tool. And it all, of course, starts with an API. And an API, if it's nothing else, it is a set of services and operations that get composed. So you might have um, some get operations, some put operations, some delete operations, all under a single API. Hopefully that API is fairly cohesive in nature, such that all of the things that it's doing are tightly related. You can have multiple APIs within your API management subscription, each of those APIs having independent operations all to themselves. Now, the next layer is that we go and we aggregate APIs into a product that we want to extend out to the rest of the world. So the product is simply a set of APIs under a name. It could be our tic-tac-toe control API um, that actually could be one API or a whole set related to tic-tac-toe game playing, score, score keeping, uh, tournament keeping, and management. For every product, we can attach policy. And the policy can reach down into the product and set governance parameters on APIs, uh, all operations at once, or individual operations. And that's really, really key for how you're actually using the proxy. Ultimately, when a developer comes to your portal and wants to use some of your APIs, they're going to subscribe for the use of a product. And in some cases, uh, you might want to adopt a product that represents a certain level of use, an expectation on usage level, so that you cannot call more than 30 times per second if you're using the free product, but you get up to 2,000 calls per second on the unlimited product. You get the freedom to specify and do this all within the Azure API management model. Some of the features that we really haven't gotten to um, are listed here. There's quite a number of features that are getting baked into the API management tool set within Azure. Remember, it's all cloud-based, so we get the benefit of the Azure team rolling in new functionality, uh, rolling in new functionality on their release cycle, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, is just about every two weeks. So you'll see these things constantly changing as it's actually pretty young in its product cycle. So at this point, I hope you've gotten a pretty good feel for what APIs are, what the API economy is all about, the importance of it, the importance of not ignoring it. And I hope you've gotten a feel for kind of what API management from an Azure perspective is all about. Now, what I'd like to do next is to give you a simple walkthrough of Azure API management as it exists today, what you need to do to build an API proxy with it, what it looks like, and uh, show you some of the configuration options as well. Now, this is a demo that you can actually do by yourself after the talk as well. And it's one that I intentionally chose because you can do that, you can practice. Um, and the demo instructions are out on the Azure API management portal in the developer documentation. And I'll show you right where that is. Okay, so here we go. Let's open a browser and I'll show you exactly where to go to access the script that we're gonna go through today. If you go to azure.microsoft.com slash APIM, it stands for API Management, of course. It takes you to the API Management homepage where you see lots of familiar things, lots of goodies. 
And at the bottom of the page under Learn More, you'll see Getting Started with API Management. So this lab introduces you to the basics, and that's what we plan to walk through today. Um, creating an API management instance, creating an API, adding operations, configuring it, and actually using it from the, from the developer portal. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and open up our trusty Azure subscription, and under App Services, we have API management. We have an option to create a new one. We need to select a subdomain to isolate our API management set of services under. And so uh, in the example lab and in our script today, we'll go through and put Contoso LTD. And I'm gonna put my initials in front of it and an O3. Select a subscription and a region be able to go to the next page. We'll follow up with giving it the name of the organization that we expect to appear on our developer portal and the administrator email that's gonna be used for notifications that come through the portal about subscriptions and issues, et cetera, et cetera. Now the advanced settings you'll want to get into if you're not just messing around. So you get to select your pricing tier either as a developer or as a standard edition. Um, standard gives you a lot more room to scale. It's also a little bit more expensive. So we're gonna go with developer for the sake of this demo. And it'll go ahead and get us started. Now I've already warmed up an instance for us and we'll go into that now. And every API management service subscription actually comes with some things set up for, set up in it already. Uh, usually when we go to the management console, and you'll see this in the one that you're creating if you're following along, that you'll have some APIs, some products in there, and um, it's pre-populated. I've, I've taken the liberty of going ahead and clearing all of that out so you can see what it looks like from scratch, literally from nothing. There are no APIs, no products, no policies. So the first thing we, that we need to do is actually add an API. In our case, the API is gonna be something extremely brain dead and simple. It's gonna be an echo API that's simply gonna return what we give it. Now, for our purposes, there is a web service out there and a REST service that actually already implements this uh, notion of an echo framework. And that's the URI that we have to supply when it's asking for a web service URL. For anyone who's not quite convinced, wants to see it in action, we can open Postman, which is a browser add-in, and tell it to send a GET request to the Azure hosted Echo API. And it'll get something. Just for evidence, we see the returned headers and everything just like we sent them with a 200 OK status. That's what the API does. And that's the native API that we implemented. This is not the API that we want to hand out to developers. We want to hand out our proxy um, URI to developers so that they can build on top of that. Ultimately, this is what we would configure to hand to our developers. And right now, notice that uh, it looks pretty generic. And I think we want to be a little bit more specific, adding a suffix to our URI so the developers know that this is specifically the echo service for Contoso subdomain. Go ahead and give that a chance to save. Remember our model that we talked about in terms of how Azure API management sees the world. You create an API, point it to a backend API that it can proxy, then we add operations that we want to reveal through that proxy. So the first operation that we'll add is something super simple. We'll add a get operation. We're just telling it to return uh, the resource that we ask for. And this is how it will appear to developers 
who are looking for the documentation on our Git API. Now, if we have parameters that we expect to be in the request, we can add those. We're going to put some simple sample parameters in here. Our first one will make required. And if nobody gives us a value, we'll go ahead and pre-populate one. We'll add another parameter. And make it not required. That'll mean we don't need to actually provide a default value. It is good form to let developers know what the typical response codes are that you could be um, returning. So we're going to go ahead and add um, into our configuration uh, 200 OK response code that is defined as uh, returned in all cases. Now keep in mind as you go through this, this will actually create the basis for the documentation that developers see. And we'll, go, and we'll go over the documentation area of the developer portal when we finish from the developer's perspective. Right now, we're kind of on the other side of the wire, um, looking at this from a service developer standpoint. Okay, so now we've got a API out there called Echo with one operation that is a get operation that will return simply what we give it in terms of headers. Um, we need to make that API available to subscribers though. And the best way to do that is by creating a product. Now, again, if you're following along, you'll see a couple default products in here. I got rid of those so you can see how they're made because there's not a whole lot to them. So the first product that we're gonna make is a starter product. Now our starter product is intended for developers and we're gonna limit the number of times a developer can call this so that we can enforce our freemium model. Uh, developer focused subscription, or actually product, where calls are limited to five times or less per minute. And we won't require any approvals for subscriptions, although we could do that. And we're not going to allow multiple simultaneous subscriptions, although we also could do that. Save this. We've got our new product. Now, administrators are automatically subscribed to our product. If we go in here, our, public our product is not automatically published. So we'll go ahead and do that. And we get an error, of course, because we need to add an API to our product. We'll add an API to our product, echo. And then we'll get an opportunity to publish. All right, so now it's published. We can see it. We should have one subscriber, which is the administrator and that is my live account there. Um, and all that's left is to really enforce that policy that we said that we wanted on our starter product. So we'll go ahead and go to policies. And remember we can tag a product with a policy. There's no default policy configured yet, so we'll add one. And it gives us an XML document. Actually, And we'll go ahead and use our template creator over here to limit the number of calls. There's several variations on this call limitation policy and it can be scoped very specifically, but in our case, we're scoping it to the product. 
So we just need the part that describes a rate limit. And we want to allow five calls or less for every 60 seconds. So that's what we'll put in. We'll click on save. Recalculate our policy. Looks good. Okay. So now, what we've effectively got, if we go to our dashboard, is an API management service with one API published in it, one operation within that Echo API, and a product that gives our subscribers access to that Echo API. There have been no applications submitted that use any of our APIs. These would be third-party applications that developers have created that they want to tell us about. Um, so what's left is to look at this from the context of being a developer. So conveniently, as an administrator, I don't even really have to sign out. I can experience the developer portal just by clicking this link in the upper right-hand corner. And we get to the portal that's created for us as a developer community on this API. You can see the APIs that are available. You can subscribe to them. And once we subscribe, we get something like this. Now, one of the beautiful things about this is you can see the documentation that's pulling from the configuration data that we made earlier. And we're really catering to a wide swath of developers. If we have Ruby, Ruby developers, we're automatically generating code that shows them how to access the API from their environment. You can do the same thing with JavaScript and C Sharp, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the other really nice things about this as a developer is from this portal, you can open up that console and we'll go ahead and call the API. It's putting in um, sample values for our parameter. We're selecting a subscription key that'll go with our request. That's how we know, that's how the API management service knows that we are individually calling this. And we can just click the Get button. We can see that it's returned a 200 OK response. We can see the response headers. And of course, we didn't provide any content. It's regurgitating exactly nothing back to us appropriately. So let's check to see if our policy gets enforced. That should be five times. I'll click it one more to get six. There we go. Rate limit is exceeded. Try again in 40 seconds, which means we've got 40 seconds left in our minute. And there we go. Now, the developer portal is really an excellent place, of course, for you to start pointing developers to, whether they're inside of your organization or outside of your organization. This will allow them to browse the APIs that you have available, get a good understanding of what they do, test them out, peruse the documentation, file issues if they need to. Um, and you've got complete control over this as an Azure customer. And I want to show you um, some of the other nice benefits that you're getting from the management side of the portal and also some of the other things that you can do from a customer presence and experience part of this portal. So we've called our API a few times at this point. And so we're going to go back to our dashboard. We're going to take a look at some of the reporting that's available. And indeed, if we look at our dashboard for today, we can see that a number of requests were made. Um, hasn't been too long since these happened, so it's kind of hard to get it centered in. But um, you can tell that we called it seven times. Uh, get some statistics on response time and bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so lots of good stuff here. There's certainly more reports available. We can zoom in on this. We also get an amazing ability to modify the developer experience. We can change all of the default styles, buttons, lists, et cetera, et cetera, for our developer portal using less. Um, and what you really have is a set of features that's paramount to a basic content management engine um, where you can add content, you can add blogs, you can add media, such as video and images. You can redo the layout, and navigation, and then control other settings. But it's a really good clearing house for you to stand up in the world uh, and distribute information. 
And I'd like to show you uh, an example of a portal that is out there in the wild that has actually done some extensive customization. It doesn't look like this at all anymore. And you can tell I've been here before. So this Azure customer created an NFL data API that you can use to build fantasy football applications on top of. And this is the portal that you would come to if you were a developer. As you can see, they've defined products and they've really customized the look and feel um, for the, uh, the developer who's visiting this and thinking about uh, actually getting into this. So I hope you can see that there's really uh, a number of things you can do. The sky's the limit with us. And API management actually is an answer to a lot of the secondary and tertiary concerns that do exist when you start setting up APIs. So hopefully you've gotten some benefit out of this. And I think next we have some Q&A.